my first experience in ministry has set the foundation of my expectation of what ministry is and what ministry is not. My first experience is not standing behind a pulpit preaching or standing behind a mic stand and singing. I was a janitor at our church. I was 14 years old, and Lynn Hardaway came to me and went, Tom, what are you doing this summer? It was 1984. I said, nothing much. He said, would you like to earn some extra money? I went, okay. He said, we need a janitor. I went, okay. So I got three thirty-five dollars an hour, which was the minimum wage at the time, $3.35. And we had three buses in our bus ministry, so I got a dollar a bus sweeping it out. So that was me. I did all summer long, and no one knew I was a janitor, only Lynn, the church secretary, the minister of music, and my parents, because mom would drop me off uh, after school. So I did that, and I was happy. And it set the foundation, because to me, ministry is serving. And in fact, when, um, I think it was last night, um, I think... My mom asked me yesterday, I was talking to her, to our bi-monthly conversation. She's in Missouri now. So she said, are you ordained? I said, no, I'm not ordained. Lynn felt like if you were leaving the church to pastor, he would ordain you. And I never left the church to be a senior pastor. I went to be an executive pastor. But I am licensed to marry in Virginia. And, I were, and, and, and it came to my mind in, in Portsmouth, it was free. I think Chesapeake and Suffolk, you had to pay $10 to file to be a, a licensed minister in Virginia. And I remember the form you had to fill out, title. I put minister, because minister is servant. So that has found, laid the foundation to my ministry today, is that when I think serving God, I think serving you. Serving God's people. Ministry is not glamorous. But as the bride of Christ, we are called to serve Him and serve one another. We are not saved to sit, soak, and sour, but to serve. Let me say that again. We are not saved to sit, soak, and sour, but to save. I remember back in 1996, I was working at QVC out in Suffolk. And the job I had was I was the supplier. I would give the packers the cardboard and the tape they needed. And a friend of mine, we started together. He got his license or certification to be in one of those standing uh, picks. So his job was to get the cardboard out of the racks so I could take it to the packers. I remember one day he went up too high and ripped off the, um, the, the head of the fountain of the fire station fountain, and water went everywhere. And at first, I thought it was chemicals. It stank. I'm thinking, what in the world? And since he did it, he had to clean it up. And, and I'm thinking, what in the world is that stink? So I asked Chuck, what is that stink? Is it chemicals? He said, no, it's just water. It was stagnant water in the pipes. QVC built that warehouse in the 1980s. So from the mid-80s to the mid-90s, it just had water in the pipes just sitting. And when you're ever in the swamp and you get that smell or when it's low tide over here, that's stagnant water. That's the stink. So when you sit and you don't do something for God, you sour and you smell. So we're not called to do that. We're, we're called to be active and to be servants. We're not called to be slothful or pride, but to serve. We don't have an invitation to be lazy we have an invitation to be part of God's work. But it can be testing, can it? People can be testing. I, I came across a, a, an, an older uh, comic strip, a peanut comic strip, where Linus, the great theologian Linus, in frustration, yelled out, I love mankind, people I can't stand. Loving mankind in abstract is very easy, but there are some people that God has put in our path, that can be trying. If you haven't met one of those people, you might be one of those people. I'm just saying, let the Holy Spirit do His job. But it can be trying. The last six weeks, we looked at the aspects of spiritual discipline. 
And um, I'm glad that some of you are looking at, at the screen, but there's, they're not listed up there. But we looked at the act of baptism, the lifestyle of prayer and its partner fasting, the importance of Bible study and worship. And last week we looked at stewardship. All these elements God uses to transform us into the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells us and He does the work in us and the end result, in theory, is us to look like Christ. And Christ is the person we pattern ourselves. And I did not take offense when my dear brother said that the Sermon on the Mount is the best sermon ever preached because I am the under-shepherd and Jesus Christ is the great shepherd. And we pattern ourselves after the great shepherd. That's why I love reading the Gospels and I love seeing the passion and the sympathy that he has for those sinners that he encountered. And he saves the judgment and the harshness to the religious right. Those who think they're better than everyone else. But we are called to pattern our life after him. And he's the great, he's the great servant. Our key passage today is Luke 22, 24, and 7. This is where Jesus sets the foundation of what it is to be a leader in the kingdom of God. He, it starts off, a dispute, a fight. Also arose among them, the disciples, as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. This isn't the first time Jesus calls his disciples on the carpet. They've been a couple times throughout the three and a half years he walked with them where these jokers would fight. I'm better than you because my lineage is of, of this house of Israel. Well, I'm better than you because I can trace my lineage to King David. Well, whatever, I'm a shepherd. Well, whatever, they would infight. So it's not, the, it's not the first we're Baptists do it. We're just known for it, the fighting Baptists. These are the fighting disciples. Because they're going, I am second better than you. And I had a manager one time that always joked and went, the runner-up is the first loser. So basically they're fighting on who, who was the losers. And Jesus was calling them out again. See, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the Gospels. There's different vantages of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have events that would are shared in each of those. John is the outlier. John is, was more focused on showing Jesus to be God, not really his historical significance. But Luke 22, they're in the upper room. John chapter 13, it's the same event. Where Jesus, where Luke, I'm sorry, shared the argument, John did not share the argument, but he wrote about the object lesson. The object lesson was the washing of the feet. So here it goes. These guys are fighting, grumbling, and Jesus calls them out and went, don't be like the Gentile rulers. You're not called to rule. You're called to serve. And then he takes off his, his garment, puts on an apron, and starts washing their feet. That is an object lesson to them. It has nothing to do about an ordinance or, or a, um, something that we should practice ourselves other than if the pastor of a church thinks too highly of himself, it might be a wake-up call for him to wash the feet of his deacons or the church members. But is it an object lesson? See, the secular leadership rules over people. The kingdom leadership serves other people. That's what the washing of the feet is called to do, and that's what we're called to do. It's a tall order, isn't it? We want to be the leaders, not the servants. We all struggle with that. See, 
we're not only called from sin, but we're called to serve. Because of we are the bride of Christ, there's an expectation to serve and that we are gifted to serve. Two points today. I couldn't get a third in there as I was praying and going through it. It was a wacky week for me. I normally do the studying on a Monday. On a Tuesday, the sermon comes together. But at the end of Tuesday, I'm going, okay, Holy Spirit, what's going on? I don't have anything for Sunday. I have an idea where I want to go. What do you want? Because he sends things my way. And then t- on Wednesday, it came to me. And I'm just glorifying God, putting this stuff together. And I'm going, there's no third point. Forget about it. Let's do two points. Let's throw caution to the wind. Back in when I was doing church planning in two, the late 2000s, um, there was a trend of doing one point. Now, I've done that a couple of times, but this feels weird because of my, my um, training. But today is, is two points for you. And maybe a poem. I don't know if it comes to me. But there is an expectation that we serve. None of us are given an invitation to be lazy. Psalm 10, 102 says, Served the Lord with gladness. We have a command to serve. Deuteronomy 13, 4. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. See, we are called to be servants. We should have a desire. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does us. He, he changes our, our, our vantage points. He changes our priorities. He changes us from wanting to be served to have a desire to serve. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. Serving is not a natural appeal. All the other disciplines that we talked about, there's, there's prayer in most cultures, even in non-Christian cultures. So it's prayer. There's examples of that. Meditating on the Scripture is great, especially for those who have a, a love the idea of research and studying. Even fasting for some of us amps our rugged discipline in our minds but serving it sounds so mundane so beneath us so pedestrian sometimes doesn't it but jesus enters and says this is the gospel matthew 28 20 28 says this the son of man came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many see jesus didn't come to serve Uh, to be served he came to serve when we embrace the gospel when we are drawn to god through the shed blood of jesus christ everything changes we become new people our priorities change we we should go from god transfers transforms us from being enemies of god and we become servants of god that's the expectation The Holy Spirit works the gospel in turning us idolaters into co-heirs with God. Remember, everything that we put before God is is idols. Wealth, career, family, sports, house, land, anything we put in front of God becomes idols. So when God comes and He transforms sinners into saints, it's a pride thing. The changing of spheres, I've once said, from secularism and self to God and others. And pride is a great thing. We have to take pride off. And John 13, 4 says this, He, Jesus, laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Now, I liken this where we have to do that too. Instead of taking off the outer garments to serve, we have to take off our pride. See, we have to go from worshiping the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I, and start worshiping the holy trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit. See, when we do that, the kingdom of God can explode. But we need to take ourselves out of the equation. I always say this. One day, I'm actually going to put it on the screen. I say it so much. But if you take the word sin, what's the middle of sin? I. Circle 
that I and erase it. When you do that, you get son, S-O-N. So when we remove me, myself, and I, we get the Jesus Christ as the one, the center of our lives, not ourselves. When we do that, we can actually follow God in, in service. See, it's part of our worship. Worship empowers serving, and serving expresses our worship. As a result of understanding the message of Jesus Christ, we can go beyond ourselves. The transformation in a person's nature happens when we embrace Christ. The gospel changes us. It transforms us. The Holy Spirit permeates our character and changes us from the inside out. We are expected to serve God and we are expected to serve one another. This takes us to we are gifted to serve. We are gifted to serve. Last week I talked about we got, I said we get supernatural gifts when we get saved. We get at least one gift from God. Most of us have multiple gifts. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 5, 11, Now there are various gifts, but the same Spirit. There are various of service, very varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, and it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one he is given the Spirit to utter wisdom, and to the other utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, but by, one, but by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. The Spirit gives us what we're given. Last week, I remember, when I said we're managing our abilities, God gives us the abilities and the amount of the abilities according to His will. God gives us an assignment. Our assignment is, a, is to utilize our gifts in service to Him. But there's two main issues when it comes to service in God's kingdom, in God's church. The first is that far too few Christians are involved in any type of ministry in the local church. We become servants to being, um, being served. I liken to this, at one time, the church was a, battle, a battleship where every, every person had a duty. I have friends of mine who served in the Navy. My dad was a sailor during Vietnam. Uh, three, all three lead pastors at Point Harbor had served uh, from four to 12 years in the Navy. But every job in the Navy, you had a duty, a battle station. So if you're a laundry person, when you get the bells ringing, you go to your battle station. If you were a boiler tech in the, the, the bottom of the ship, you heard the bells sing, you would man your duty, your battle station. But we have gone from a battleship to a cruise ship where instead of having everyone has a duty, only a handful of people are doing it and the majority of the people are sitting back, relaxing, and criticizing those who are doing it. That's one of the issues we have in our church. The other one is that we have people serving, but they're serving in the wrong ministry because they're not equipped to do the job that they're doing. It reminds me of a story between a, a ship captain and the engineer. They were arguing about who was the more important in the function of the ship, 
The captain says, I'm the most important person because I direct the, the ship where it's going. The engineer going, no, I am more important because I make sure the engine is running to get us there. They couldn't get past the argument, so they, 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 they switched jobs. The engineer went to the bridge, and the captain went down to the boiler. After a few hours, the captain runs up to the bridge, oil all over his face, soot all over his clothes. He's waving the monkey wrench in the air going, I can't get the ship going. And the engineer looked at him and went, we're aground. They're stuck because the, the engineer grounded the ship and the captain was frustrated because he couldn't get the engine to go. They were doing the wrong job. They, they, didn't, they were not functioning. Some of you might be frustrated today with your service here at Christ Life Church. I'm hoping not. But the reason why is that we have spiritual gifts that will direct us to us. Knowing your spiritual gift will enable you to find a place to minister here. Just remember the passage I read, there's multiple aspects of church, functions. See, we don't think too much of your thumb, right? You don't think much of your big toe. You think they're mundane pieces of the body. But did you know if you didn't have a big toe, you couldn't walk right? If you didn't have a thumb, you can't hold on to things. Back in the Old Testament, when the Assyrian army would conquer a, a, a country, they would take the leaders, the king and his court, and they would... This is how brutal they were. They would cut off their thumbs and cut off their big toes and throw them in the dungeon. And for sport, they would throw meat in the dungeon and watch them try to fight to get to the meat and try to hold on to the meat to eat without thumbs. So things that we think are mundane and not important, ministries are needed. Take a minute and listen. It's quiet, right? No crying babies, no talking toddlers. There's a reason for that. We have people behind the scenes taking care of babies. They're the thumbs. Look around. I see no dust. Bathrooms are cleaned. People behind the scenes serving. They're the big toe. They're not prevalent, they're not seen. And if you're one of those, thank you. Thank you for your service. One of the first weeks I was here, I sent Gary a text, went, do me a favor, could you let me know who serves so I can pray over them? And of course, Kathy jumps in and gives me this really nice printed out, typed out sheet on who does what, and, and some names I didn't know, and because they come once in a blue moon, and and those who I knew know because I get to know you and I can pray for you and thank you. But there's a lot of you who do things behind the scenes and I want to say thank you for that. And the Holy Spirit is using you. But that's one of the reasons why some of you are frustrated because you're using a screwdriver to drive in a nail instead of a hammer. And then using a hammer to drive in a screw instead of a screwdriver. You're using the wrong tools or you're in the wrong ministry because you're not sure what your, your spiritual gift is. But the Holy Spirit tells us we should make it a priority to know who, what our spiritual gifts are. Knowing your spiritual gifts will help you discern the will of God. So if you know you're not called to be a teacher, when someone when a need of a teacher arises and Rick or Gary or or, or someone comes up to you and oh, we need a Sunday school teacher, could you teach it? You can say, thank you, but no, that's not my gifting. My mom has a lot of good qualities, but she cannot stand little kids. She told me and my two sisters she liked us more when we became teenagers because she didn't, doesn't like kids. My dad was great with kids, and we kind of drifted apart when we became teenagers because he was still trying to relate to us as kids. But me and my sisters grew up, and my mom and dad were partners in the fourth and fifth grade teach department. My mom was a director, so her job was to make sure the records were kept. She would teach the big, 
And then we would separate, and Dad taught the boys, and the lady taught the girls. I was under his leadership, and he's a great, he's a great teacher when it comes to kids. But my mom is detailed-oriented, but not a teacher, and she hated it. But she did it because it was a need, so she was miserable. So I know this, but when they went to Roanoke area and they joined their church, she became the, uh, the choir secretary, and she thrived. She loved it. She, had every, she did it for 20 years before she retired a, a couple years ago because she had to take care of dad. But she loved it because that was her niche. Organization, making sure things ran well. So know your spiritual giftedness and you would be great. There's a very distinct relationship between knowing God's will and understanding your spiritual giftedness. Now, some of you who was here this last week and this week are a little frustrated with me. Okay, Tom, you're talking about spiritual gifts, how to manage them, how to know them. I had not a clue what my spiritual gift is. I'm glad you asked. I'm here to equip you. I pray through this. God, help me help you. I'm Jerry Maguire without the stupid, stupid um, um, story. I'm helping you. I did a Google search, and I came across giftstest.com. It's behind me on the screen. You can take a look at it. It's free. I actually, there's 66 questions. And you can put your name on it, and it will email you the, um, re the results. And take your time taking it. If you don't know your spiritual gifts, take it. 66 minutes. Take your time. If you come to me and went, Tom, what are my natural abilities? I would go, okay, what are your interests? Um, do you like playing baseball? Do you like sewing? Do you like bowling? And you'll go, not really. I said, well, then you're not a baseball player. You're not a seamstress. And you're not a bowler. What do you like to do? I like to read. Okay, then read. So we have to ask the Holy Spirit, reveal to me what are my gifts. Help me to know, to discern. And let me caution you. When you take this, take it honestly. Because sometimes we read the question and we'll go, well, I wish I was like that. I'll put a four or, uh, or a five. But you, that's not really you. Say, instead of going, I wish I was that, ask the Holy Spirit, is this me? When you take the test and you get the result, go to your family and your friends and go, do I have the act of the gift of mercy? And then when they stop laughing, they can say, no, I'm sorry, not really. A friend of mine, he was a minister. He was the admin pastor when I was the minister of music at Fellowship. And he left and went to a church in Savannah and was a pastor there for two years. And then Teresa and I visited him when he was in the D.C. area as a pastor. Real nice guy, but he tell you straightly that he doesn't like people. Most people don't like him. They love his wife. She's a sweetheart of a woman. She was our piano player. And then about two or three years after we visited him in, in, in the D.C. area, he stepped down and became a school administrator for his Christian school. And he thrived. He was not a gifted pastor. He was not a gifted teacher. But he was a gifted administrator. So for five, six years, he was miserable thinking ministry means pastoring. Ministry means preaching. No. Ministry means serving. Serving where, how God has equipped you. Serving how God has given you the tools. He's been at that same school almost 20 years. Loving it. So, ask, okay, this is my results. Do you affirm that in me? Because family, we're family. The Holy Spirit will reveal to us someone that is called to do something. Like I shared, I think, a few weeks ago, when I surrendered my life to ministry, the first thing that Lynn told me is about time. Because he saw the Holy Spirit equipping me to do the function that he was 
putting in my heart at 16. So some of you are struggling with that or resisting that. And let me tell you this, you will never win against God. God will always have his way. Sometimes he does it lovingly or sometimes he's going to get that stick out and beat the living snot out of you until you submit to his authority. But he always uses the carrot first, not the stick. Now, to help you, my job is to equip you, to encourage you, and challenge you. There's a number of verses behind me on the screen. Write them down. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. Romans 12, 4 through 8. First, I'm not going to read all of them. They're behind me. These are all the passages that I came across that deal with the spiritual gifts. And look at these techie people taking pictures. You guys are so much smarter than me. I'll be sitting there trying to write them down real quick. And now the rest of them are, are copying. Oh, that's smart. Oh, yeah. That's not me. I'm, I'm not techie at all. But see, your job is to read. God's job, the Holy Spirit, is to illuminate, to show you what you are doing right and what you're doing wrong. Some of you are miserable because you grew up like I did, and there's an expectation of doing things. But the Holy Spirit says that's an expectation of a generation. It's not the expectation of me. I remember back in 2012, Teresa and I and two-year-old Ripley went to Missouri. And they had just had a snowstorm. We flew into Kansas City. And I came out and went, oh, it's brisk out here. It's January, snow. And Teresa went, she told me later, she went, I don't know if I want to live in snow like this. But we went an hour and a half down to a place called Apple City, Missouri. It had a blinking yellow light. I'm not exaggerating. If you Google, Google it, it's a one square mile. They had a, a dollar general. But I remember I had a suit and tie on. And one of the guys went, Pastor Tom, you look uncomfortable. And I'm going, why do I look uncomfortable? I hate suits. I hate ties. That's a generational thing. I just finished watching Dr. Blake Mysteries in the 1950s Australia country doctor discovering ministries. And I think this is cool. Nice suit, vest. He had the hat that always matched, reminded me of my grandfather. My grandfather passed away, and all 20 of us grandkids got tw two hats of his. He had so many fedoras that for all his suits. Old school. I think that's great in, in theory, but not comfortable at all. I like being loosey-goosey and comfortable. It's a generational thing. So some of you need to struggle with that, going, okay, God, what is it that you want me to do? Not what we did back in the 1980s or 90s. Some of you going, that's history, Tom. That's history book lesson to me. But for some of us who lived through it, it's a different time. Now we're doing ministry. Oh, we need to contact somebody, take out our smartphones, and call. Back then, I remember 1994 as a youth pastor coming into the office in Richmond and having a stack of pink slips. Remember why you're out slips? So-and-so called for you. Please return their call. Now, if so-and-so needed to get a hold of you, they would most likely text me, not call. But most of us, when our phone rings, we look like, why is my phone ringing? Why don't they just text me? Technology is different. But God uses different things at different times. And like what our brother talked about, Billy Graham. Billy Graham is a, is a unicorn, John Houston calls him. Most of us are, are serving in smaller churches, praising God, teaching. And then there's the unicorns that God allows to, t to be read about, to write books, to encourage people that way around the world. And like I said last week, be the best you God has designed. God has not designed me to be Billy Graham. You know what? Billy Graham was not designed to be Tom Thomason. Because I read his autobiography, and the years that he was the most miserable were the years that he was pastoring a church. Evangelists cannot pastor churches. I've talked to many a guy. I worked with a guy that was trying to pastor a church. I was his executive pastor, but he was an evangelist at heart, 
And he was miserable, and the church got an in-your-face sermon every Sunday. And now he's an evangelist again. He's a whole lot happier. So embrace the way God has formed you. But we all have a job to do. Reminds me of a story of a meeting that Winston Churchill had during World War II. The battle was going on for Britain. And he met with the labor unions because they needed coal. They needed fuel for the fire to keep people alive. So he met with them and challenged them to get the coal output more. And he said, Imagine with you if you imagine me with imagine with me if you would please. Say that fast five times. At the end of the war, when we have the big parade, the sailors would be marching first because they kept the, the sea lanes open. Next comes the army who came home from Dunkirk and went on to win in North Africa. Next would be the airmen who fought the Brit and cleared the British skies. And lastly, but most importantly, would be thousands upon thousands of soot-faced, sweat-stained men with coal mining caps on, marching behind them. And when someone from the crowd yells, where were you during the struggle? They would say, we were in the depth of earth with our faces to the coal. Not all jobs in church are glorious. Not all church, jobs at church are well known. Most of the most important jobs are having your faces to the coal. And I guarantee you, I may have a handful of people thank me in heaven for what I did, but most of you will have so many more people thanking you for watching their kids. Because you watched little Junior that one Sunday and I didn't have to hold him, I was able to understand the gospel and get saved. Because of you changed little Sally's diapers, my husband came and heard the gospel and he could be the man of God that God called him to do. Because you spent your Saturdays making sure that the, 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 sun, that the church was clean, there was no distractions of any cobwebs so I can actually worship God. We are all caught, called to serve others and serve God. Remember, the, the gospel of Christ transforms sinners against God into servants of God. The Holy Spirit works through the gospel to turn those who serve their idols now being servants of God. One of the clearest indications that, God, that people have truly believed the gospel is that they stop worshiping self and stop worshiping God. That they stop serving self and start serving others. It's a tall order, but that's what we're called to do. Will you step forward and serve God and serve others? Let's pray.